This is Git Minutes episode 37 and the third part from Git Merge 2015. Git Minutes is a show for proficient Git users featuring stories, discussions, ideas, and other things useful for those using Git today. I'm your host, Thomas Ferris Nikolaisen. You can find more information about the show and how to support it on gitminutes.com. This episode is recorded on the 9th of April 2015. And the show notes are available on links.gitminutes.com slash 37. Gitminus is hosted and sponsored by DigitalOcean. You know how there are like two kinds of cloud servers you can rent? Uh, you got like the permanent kind of uh, VPS where you pay per month and it's a bit of work to get it up and running. And then there's the other kind where you can quickly spin up to scale with you know, sudden amount spikes in traffic or, or work to do. But the, the flexibility of this you know, suddenly spinning up, it usually comes with a pretty high price uh, per minute. And with DigitalOcean, you get the best of both worlds. For example, I pay $5 a month for this uh, low tier server where I host the audio of the podcast. And uh, let's say if I need to fire up some on-demand number uh, number crunching job, uh, and I can launch that using their API and get a top tier 64 gigabytes of RAM instance with 20 CPUs, and then I can let it work for 30 minutes and then power it off again using their API. And we're actually going to do something like this uh, at my day job, and we're projecting that it'll save us thousands of dollars uh, on a monthly basis uh, compared to renting a cluster of high-end servers. So. Uh, you can try it out yourself. Go and sign up for DigitalOcean uh, using the promo code GitMinutes10 and you'll get $10 uh, worth of credit. In this third part from Git Merge 2015, I first talked to Stefan Bello, who's a Git contributor from Google. Uh, we'll talk about the Git protocol and some ideas for improving it in future versions. Second up is Robert van Haaren, who was a regular visitor to the conference. And finally, I talked to Avar Arnfjord Bjarmason, who is another contribu Git contributor. We'll talk about internationalization and how companies could potentially contribute to Git. So it's still the second day of uh, Git Merge 2015. I'm sitting here now with uh, Stefan Bello. From Google. Hello. Okay, so tell us a bit about yourself. Who are you, and what's your involvement with the uh, Git project? Um, so, I started contributing to Git like two and a half years ago. Uh, I before that, I was uh, involved in the open source community, um, especially in games and you know this little fun stuff. But Git is a bit more serious, I guess. And yeah, that's what uh, also got me the job at Google because. Uh, your involvement yeah. with Git. Yeah. Oh, cool. And That's were you uh, uh, contributing then mostly to Git Core, I, I suppose? Yeah, I, I did um, Git Core and nothing else. So after joining Google now, I started um, doing Garrett and JGit as well. Okay. So. And uh, which part of Git uh, have you been involved in? Uh, so I started with really small cleanups, like organizing the mail map file, which nobody ever gave a fuck about. Uh -huh. And um, then running it through wall grind and looking for memory leaks, you know, I really like this uh, making Git um, cleaning up the code a bit and uh, yeah, this this micro cleaning. Yeah. I think that's what I like most. And <clears throat> eventually, I started uh, rewriting a shell script into C. Oh, I think it was revert. I I don't remember. Yeah. So this is like the converting scripts into built-ins, uh, like this Google Summer of Code uh, project uh, that we talked about yesterday. Um, no, I did it just on my own because I had like uh, interest in having everything in C. Because I personally don't really like um, scripted languages; yeah. they feel dirty. So. <laughs> and uh, they also uh, usually comes with a boost in performance. Uh. Uh, yeah, but. It didn't. I, I I didn't measure actually. Oh, okay. uh, it's just uh, <laughs> nice. So uh, you also had a couple of uh, interesting ideas or discussions yesterday at the Dev Summit. What was your uh, kind of takeaways? 
and interesting ideas that were discussed. What do you mean by that? Uh, w uh, so which you had some idea that you wanted to discuss about the protocol, right? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, right. Tell um, us about that. So um, when uh, Git was initially created, it was I think it, it, it's uh, just the Linus attitude to micro optimize a little bit. So um, to save one round trip time, the first thing uh, what happens is if you ha talk to a server, the server just blasts all the branches and tags and what he has essentially. And uh, that's grown over time. So if you uh, say um, just fetch uh, the Linux kernel, um, there are lots of um, tags and branches and stuff like that. So uh, the server will uh, uh, um, advertise like half a megabyte of stuff just just before we we actually talk about what objects do I get and and so even if there's uh, no update uh, in the sense that you're already up to date, you you must transmit half a megabyte over the wire, yeah. and that what. I don't like about the protocol. So um, the idea is uh, to um, have first some kind of negotiation of the capabilities, which is hopefully very small, and then afterwards, uh, yeah, transmit the refs and, and branches and I mean, such uh, things. Just uh, to kind of get like a bit of a basic grasp on uh, on what happens on the wire. Uh, so. so you mentioned content negotiation. Is that a bit like, or uh, there, that doesn't really take place in Git as it is now? Did I understand that correctly? Uh, so um, currently, the way it works is first uh, the server advertises what. So I'm talking about fetching now. Yeah. Um, so the server advertises. Okay, I have like the master branch and it's pointing to this um, commit, and uh, afterwards uh, there is the negotiation of um, client and server what uh, is actually the pack that needs to be transmitted. So oh, yeah. um, they need to figure out, uh, oh, I don't have that yet, what the server advertised. So um, the server will basically send everything that the client doesn't say that it has. Right, but it, right. But it's easy to imagine, for example, that the client doesn't really want to have all the branches or all the references, for example, and are only interested in, in a few. And, but that's not currently <laughs> supported, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Let's think a bit about the ideal solution for this, uh, like was discussed yesterday. Um, I mean, I, I only know well, somewhat of the HTTP content negotiation when you like you say send a request to a server, and then there's some header saying, uh, as a client, I'll happily want this and this and that, and if I can't get that, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, instead. I mean, the main problem is that uh, the protocol wasn't designed to have first like this small. Um, I want this or that or yeah. whatever. I mean, even the server could just talk first, but he should not or it should not uh, have so much content in the first uh, round of, of um, talking. It's more like, hello, and I can do this, and what can you do, and nice to meet you. Yeah. You know, a very, very s small uh, amount of data would be amazing to have there. Yeah. So. On, on the SSH uh, protocol, I imagine that you open an SSH connection and send a command to the server saying, uh, oh, send yeah. me your stuff. Uh, uh, well, um, so you, you open the SSH connection and then uh, you instruct to use git upload pack because that's what the server does. It yeah. uploads the pack to you uh, while I'm uh, fetching and then um, the server just starts uh, advertising the branches yeah. and tags. And, and and if we're doing smart HTTP instead, uh, that's a bit different? Um, I haven't really looked into uh, a smart HTTP. Okay. Uh, it was interesting yesterday in the discussion how you kind of need to tread carefully when you're coming up with a new uh, content negotiation strategy that you have to keep all these different protocols in mind. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, when I was reading the documentation, I even found, um, I mean, uh, I've joined Git very late, so uh, I don't know all the historic details, but there was uh, Arzink, Arzink um, as yeah. well, so. I think there was FTP as a protocol once yeah. upon a time too, but I don't <laughs> think it works anymore, I'm not sure. I think it's deprecated by now, Yeah. so nobody should use it anymore. Yeah. 
So, uh, what's the roadmap for uh, enhancing uh, the, this uh, the protocol? Uh, so, I think Junio wants to be done within this year. I don't have a closer roadmap to that. So, we want to keep the discussion going, and maybe it happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, there, is there any like real code or examples uh, showing off how a new uh, version could could look like? I did some rough sketches, but uh, okay. they didn't really work out yet. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, let's say that uh, what will typically happen next is that you or somebody else come up with some more ideas that turns into code and to being some uh, some patches maybe, and then uh, when it lands in in Git, uh, Git will have to still be backwards compatible with uh, with the old style of working, of course. Um, so. One of the core issues of Git is to uh, be backwards compatible. So that's what uh, Junior is uh, very concerned about. Yeah. So I guess the user should not even, um, yeah, know it, or he doesn't need to have to know it, essentially. Yeah, exactly. So no, nothing will change for the user, but they might. We might see some uh, big. Uh, I, I don't know if you can make new features based on uh, this new kind of protocol that say that you want to clone in a different fashion or maybe do some kind of thin, thinner clones. Yeah, I, I guess that was one of the uh, problems uh, up until now. So lots of talk has been uh, done on like narrow clones yeah. where you just check out um, or get only one subdirectory or um, uh, just a um, specific part of the repository. And that wasn't possible. Up and Usually, the discussion ends there. Oh man, the wire protocol stops us. Oh. Let's don't rewrite it. So that's kind of where we need to start if we want to make some changes. Yeah, I think it's it's one of the fundamental steps uh, which enables lots of further enhancements. Do you know any other technologies that are similar that have a similar uh, negotiation step? Uh, somebody on the mailing list compared it to I think OpenSSL or okay. uh, all this security stuff where you uh, first negotiate uh, which kind of cryptography you're going to use because uh, at the cryptography um, stuff, you really um, want to have it interchangeable fast. So because if, if one of the algorithms is broken, you can just say, okay, we don't use it anymore mm. and plug in a new one. And you don't have to rewrite the whole thing, but just change the config on the server and be done. Yeah. So, uh, apart from uh, new uh, new wire protocol ideas, were there any other discussions yesterday that you found particularly interesting, or maybe something from today? Um, yeah, I mean, we had the discussion on why is Git so slow yesterday, and I mean, it's really <laughs> fast. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. There, there are still some bottlenecks. Of course, there are bottlenecks, but uh, the way you look at it as a as a uh, as a community, like it's still faster than most of any other yeah. tools, and still, our oh, man, our tool sucks. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any like favorite <laughs> or uh, least favorite parts of Git that uh, that slow 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 you down? I, I think um, having lots of refs or branches is the crucial point. We talked about it on the wire now, and uh, also once it's, it lands on your hot disk, you still have the same problem, because um, currently there's a, or it used to be the way that you have um, one file per branch, and so you had lots of files, and uh, that was slow. So it was optimized to have just one file containing all um, the branches. It's a packed refs file, and now you would need to open this file containing lots of branches and see uh, for the right branch. And, and that would make also um, things slow. Mm -hmm. I, if you want to, say, delete one specific uh, branch out of uh, thousands of branches. OK. And is there like a proposed solutions for doing that differently? Or any ideas? <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, I think there were some ideas floating around to yeah. just throw away all the uh, file system um, layout and use a database for it, but like, that like would be very 
very big change in Git. Uh, I guess so, and I'm not going to tackle that one, I guess. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. I mean, yeah. Okay, uh, anything else uh, you want to mention about the conference? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But <laughs> cool. Thank you very much for talking with me, Stefan. Thanks. Now I'm talking to uh, Robert van Haren. Yes. Yeah. That sounds Dutch. Yeah, it's Dutch, yeah. So uh, can you tell us why? what are you doing at Gitmerge? Uh, well, I'm uh, with, with some friends and we thought it would be cool to, to see a, a conference from Git. Yeah. Because it's uh, 10 years now and uh, I thought it would be be uh, great to learn some new things on Git. So uh, there was, yesterday there was a training for uh, yeah. for the Git users. Yeah. Uh, what what was it like, and what did you learn? Um, well, it was not really what we expected. It were um, some things were great. Well, some things uh, it's like you're never gonna use. It's like from uh, some of those exceptions, you're almost not gonna find in your daily workflow, but. Overall, it was is a great uh, learning experience, but yeah, yeah, just cool to uh, to learn new things and uh, see what. And uh, any, what did you think about the the talk that was in uh, right now about uh, how to teach Git? Yeah, it's uh, like a sort of a psychological view uh, on it, right? Yeah. With the with the teaching uh, graphs and. Uh, so uh, how do you guys uh, use uh, Git at your company? Yeah, also with, with workflows and uh, branches and uh, when we're at different locations. But not we're also using it uh, for our... We started up uh, a tech um, startup. We're a tech startup and, and it's about um, getting developers more social on on conferences and on hackathons and Oh, that's what your startup is about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. what's it called? Uh, it's called Social Hack. Social Hack. Social Hack. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So um, uh, our uh, software company we're starting up. It's called Duxilio. So it's a sort of a software house. And uh, Social Hack is one of those products, and we're still working on it. And also a little bit promoting it here and uh, see what people think and what their opinions are on it. And okay. is, is it running like for this conference uh, somewhere? Uh, no, like? no, it's not running. No, okay. no, just just uh, getting to know and getting connected a little here too. And uh, so at the at the next Git conference, uh, yeah, maybe, some kind maybe, of yeah, maybe, social service yeah. running around it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more like uh, to uh, to help other developers and see what projects they're working on and and maybe you can join and help with them and. Uh, you can see location-based where other developers are and see what languages they're talking about. And we're cool. thinking to use the uh, GitHub API to uh, to get our data from GitHub. You know, and to uh, so you can see where uh, yeah. what commits are taking place at the conference. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah. who's there? Like uh, their, yeah. their their GitHub Just names and stuff like that. The skills and uh, where where they're working and uh, that would be kind of cool if you could kind of see like a cluster of. Yeah. Uh, People who are often contributing to uh, libgit2 or some project like that, and yeah. you see, ah, yeah. they're all in in that room right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you uh, very much for talking with me, yeah. and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You too. Yeah. So I'm uh, now talking to. Var uh, Arnfjord Bjarnason? No, Bjarnason. Uh, Ivar Artfjord Bjarmason, it's uh, quite a difficult ma name, but... Uh, I, I like to think I did better than most uh, yeah, yeah, English-speaking uh, people would. Uh, yeah, so uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Who are you and how are you involved with the Git project? Uh, so, um, I'm Icelandic, uh, but I, I, live in, uh, I live and work in Amsterdam for, uh, for Booking.com and I've been for the last four or five years or so. Since 2010, whatever, whatever that is. Um, how am I involved in the Git project? So I haven't been in, I haven't been very involved recently, but um, a few years ago I did a couple of major things. Like um, I implemented the initial translation support for Git, which um, allows you to have a version of Git that shouts at you in German, which I'm quite proud of. <laughs> um, and then I did a bunch of work on the test suite, uh, which is not like really at all visible to uh, to users but I used to use this custom output format 
uh, that, uh, that I then converted to a slightly more standard TAP format, test anything protocol. Okay. Uh, which allows you to use like standard tools to run tests in parallel and things like that. Uh, so, and then I've done a bunch of miscellaneous patches. So the initial reason I started working on any of this was um, because I wanted to learn how Git works. Um, and eventually you start peeking around the source code. And doing translation, I found, uh, since I, I was very involved in, to segue a bit, I was, I was very involved with uh, translation from MediaWiki, which runs Wikipedia. Ah. Um, so I found that it's a really nice way to like, get to know a piece of software, yeah. if, you're, if you're interested. Because uh, it involves you know, some light work, like it, it's, not, it's not core work, but it's something. And then subsequently, you have to go through like all the source files, and like you know, you have to read and understand them to to see what's going on. So, yeah. so that gave me a lot of just Git experience. And I bet every open source project you you find, there's probably an Icelandic translation that needs some work. <laughs> so the funny thing is actually that um, I I've been meaning to do the Icelandic translation, but I don't use my computer in Icelandic, <laughs> and I haven't done the one for Git. Uh, so. I have no direct benefit from this effort at all, oh. but uh, I understand that it's it's quite useful for um, for other people, like yeah. especially because um, Git is used all over the world, yeah. and um, there's translations now for Chinese, Japanese, and languages where even programmers like are not traditionally very fluent in English. So uh, I think it's very nice that it's useful for them, and uh, hopefully that expands the community a bit. Absolutely. You know, that's uh, something uh, Scott talked about uh, at, la at the last Git Merge conference was like uh, getting the Git book translated into many languages Yeah. Uh, in its own right. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a lot of work and it's kind of has to be community based. Yeah. And but it's so rewarding when it's when it's out there or yeah. it really helps. Yeah, one of the uh, like as a, as a slight segue again with regards to the Icelandic translation, one uh, so partially the reason I haven't done it is laziness. But another reason is that I have this gist file, which is on GitHub, where I'm trying to translate all the core concepts. Like, oh, yeah. you know, should, I, should branch be a branch as in a tree, or should it be something like similar to a digression? Yeah. You know, does it make sense to like, translate tag as label and things like that? Mm -hmm. So uh, Because you, you have this whole, like Git brings with it this whole worldview, which you want to map to a natural language. Yeah. And, um, there's been some arguments about, like, I've seen some arguments with the German translation, for instance. Yeah, exactly. Like, some people want, <laughs> basically, uh, what's the word again? Like, there's two ways of basically translating German programs. Like, one is to like use the traditional German, where you, you know, the computer is was it Rechner or something? Yeah. And then uh, the other is just computer commit tree branch and so on. Like, they're imported uh, a lot of English words into German it, vocabulary. It, just yeah. Uh, to keep it simple, I, I don't know how it is in Icelandic. Are you? I know that some Norwegians can be a bit pedantic about they want to say every yeah. uh, word in proper Norwegian, and uh, yeah. and uh, but still in everyday speech, there's a lot of English in there as well. Yeah. I don't know how it is uh, with you guys. It's it's a bit odd with Icelandic. Like um, I usually like Icelanders are very fluent in English, especially if you if you tend to work with computers. Um, I don't actually know of anybody that I've worked with, like back when I was a programmer in Iceland in my professional career, that used like their UI in Icelandic. Uh, but so most people just tend to use English, even for tools yeah. and things like that. But at the same time, there's this very rich history for um, like doing rich translations, yeah. like bringing things into the language. Like even even like the translation for computer, for instance, is. Uh, Basically, numeric profit in Icelandic <laughs> and things like that. What's and, uh, the word? Can you can you say it? Uh, tölva. Uh -huh. So uh, so so. Uh, and people say that. Yeah. So number. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an everyday. That's an everyday part of this. So like uh, number is tala, and um, profit is tölva. So it, they combine those two. And there's similar things for like compiler and uh, syntax tree and all these kind of things. Um, yeah. So it's a very. It's a very self-contained language in a way, mm. more so than most others. Yeah, this, this is a big like tangent we've gone out. Yeah, 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 for sure, sure. Like the, the Norwegian <laughs> word is uh, da data machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's been shortened, so people actually call computers are called da datas. Yeah. Which sounds awfully confusing now when I think about it from uh, an English. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, so this is definitely a huge uh, digression, which is something I'm very good at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, everything's allowed. It's my podcast. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's just go back to the conference uh, topic. What uh, what did you uh, think about yesterday? Any takeaways or discussions um, that you thought were important to have or were interesting? So uh, one of the main reasons why for uh, for why I'm here is um, so. I'm here. I'm here on behalf of Booking.com. Like they, they sent me. I would have been interested in going anyway, probably. Yeah. But um, we have some scalability issues with Git because we have uh, we have hundreds of developers. Uh, so that's that was the main thing I wanted to get out of this conference. Like just go and talk to the talk to the other devs about you know some of these issues we're facing and uh, and it's not just us. Like th there's there's a lot of other companies that are having similar growing pains with Git. Mm -hmm. um, so the good news is, uh, like going forward, is that none of these problems are inherent to like what Git could be, the data model and things like that. It's really just implementation that uh, that's suffering from a lot of these growing pains. But it's not going to be easy to fix some of these things with the implementation. Mm -hmm. um, these conferences like don't tend to have tangible results right away, yeah. obviously. But like people talk a lot, and uh, you know they get to know each other's problems and uh, things like that. I mean, there there was a buzz to it yesterday, yeah. and which kind of will have an effect on on what uh, you devs will prioritize and think about. Yeah. Uh, in the months and maybe years to come. Yeah. And and it's it's a bit funny because yesterday it was like yeah you know apart from the. Uh, the bitmap and a few other like fixes. Uh, we haven't really done anything major yep. to improve performance lately. But at the same time, like at least half of these talks that are today are about how companies, you know, such as uh, well, at, the, at, at the proportions of your own yep. uh, Booking.com have actually managed to work around these problems and scale up Git in, in various ways. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think about those efforts that were spoken or described here today? Is that something you can use? And uh, if not, uh, which ones are the improvements that you would most like to see in, in Git? So, so one of the, like just to take Google as an example, uh, basically what it seems that Google has done is they've, they've gone the path of simply splitting their repos. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we're still reluctant to do at work is, is do something like that. So you, you got the mono repo. Yeah. So uh, so the reason for that is basically that um, we have we have a big code base and we get a lot of benefit from being able to change uh, both uh, the users of some library and the library itself yeah. in an atomic way. Yeah. So we we can do a rollout when we go from A to B and we can just simply change the code base in in its entirety and not have to worry about versioning like libraries or incompatibil incompatibilities like that. Um, so, this is uh, this is basically the, the same problem that Facebook had. Yeah. Um, which, and they ended up switching to Mercurial. Um, I think mostly because I don't know the full history behind that, but they implemented some things that could have been implemented on top of Git. Yeah. Uh, but for whatever reason, they they chose to go for Mercurial. Maybe they were more comfortable with it, or. You know, they yeah, like to extend it in Python or something. I, I, I think the, their impression was that it was easier to extend um, Mercurial code because it is Python, yeah. which is higher level and yeah. I guess less code to do what you want to oh, yeah. do and a more maybe a bit more modular in its extension model. Yeah, yeah. so that's definitely true. Um, but when people face scalability issues with Git, um, they face very different kinds of challenges depending on their use case. Yeah. So you can have you have some repositories where people simply have like big binary files, which is something that like Git does not have inherent issues with if you look at the data model. But the Git client, as it is, like has has very big issues with because it's mainly optimized for the storing source code text use case. Yeah. But then you have other repositories where you have a lot of commits, hundreds of thousands. You may have lots of tags or or uh, branches and so on. Um, and then there's the size of the tree itself, the checked out tree. As uh, the main, like one of the two main bottlenecks that uh, Facebook faced was that they simply have a huge checkout tree, yeah. and then whenever they run the equivalent of Git status, they have to search through the entire tree to figure out what changed and so on. Yeah. Um, so what they ended up doing was um, an I notify based solution, uh, 
where basically their version of Git status looks at a transaction log from the last time they ran Git status instead of looking at the file system. So there's been similar nascent efforts for that in Git. Really? Uh, yeah, uh, using, uh, using iNotify, but I'm not quite sure what the status of that is. Okay. Is that the same problem you got at uh, Booking.com? So it turned out that the, the main problem that we had was, um, well, problem and benefit. We used this tool called uh, Git Deploy that we wrote internally, which okay. uh, we ended up open sourcing. And briefly what Git Deploy does is uh, it manages your deployment history in Git. It's not a deployment tool in and of itself. Uh, so every time we do a deployment, we create a tag in the Git repository, yeah. which is something like the role of the server, for instance, like web server dash, you know, it, the, the date and time of day in ISO yeah. format. Um, so these, these things add up because we have a lot of deployments. We deploy hundreds of times a day. Um, and we have a big repository where we had something like, like a few hundred thousand commits, and every fifth commit would have, on average, would have a tag wow. associated with it. So we were ending up, ending up with hundreds of thousands of tags. And um, it shouldn't be an inherent issue, but this ends up being, like, ends up causing a lot of growing pains in Git. So when you write git tag in your repository, how long does it take to finish? Um, so that, that actually doesn't take that long. Uh, so, because when you create a tag, you just create a new file, so that's actually super fast. Okay. But uh, the main problems we had was when you do a pool, for various reasons, Git needs to like validate the history that is go getting in, which, and a lot of these operations involve looking at all reachable heads in the repository, which, you know, ends up looking at these hundreds of thousands of tags and so on. Okay. So, our <laughs> Our solution to this, which I implemented, was more of a cop-out, which is that we just have these tags on a rotating schedule where okay. we delete the old ones. Oh. Um, so that ended up taking operations like git pool on a local network from, uh, say, 15 to 20 seconds down to, like, two or three. Um, we still have to do something about our accumulation of branches, but that's slightly more complex, and uh, but okay. I, I hope to uh, address that in, in the future. So... Uh, how do you uh, propose or imagine that uh, this could get fixed uh, on a Git uh, level? So, um, um, like most operations in Git don't need to care about there being lots of tags already. Uh, like when you're, when you're doing a pool and you're updating, you do a pool and you have some updates to say the master branch, like there's no inherent reason for some, why something needs to look at uh, the list of old tags and so on. Yeah. Uh, one simple example um, for why things were slow is just running git log to get one commit and piping that to dev null would take a second. And the reason for that is that there, we would end up with a huge um, pack ref file which contained all the tags and all the references. And that has to be open and parsed, parsed in its entirety before you can do anything. Okay. So. Um, I'm actually, so it would be nice if somebody solved that, but like, personally, I'm no longer so interested in it since, uh, since basically like my use case for it was solved. But, uh, okay. but at least you got it thrown out there that this is a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And pr if anybody else, else has the problem as well, yeah, you know, it, it might become an effort to, to to fix it somehow, and then yeah, indeed. Um, but then. You, you have other scalability issues going forward, like uh, even if you don't add a lot of binaries to your repo, uh, you eventually end up with a repo that, like, instead of being ours is about a gig and a half, but uh, what if it what if it was ten times that size, or like or like a hundred times that size? Yeah. Um, so that's it'd be very interesting to see how we how we try to address those issues going forward. Mm. I mean, that doesn't really sound so large compared to what Google had going. They had a few multi gigabyte repositories. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of this you can solve with throwing hardware at it. Yeah, like, uh, you know. SSDs and... Yeah. Any other key takeaways from yesterday or today that you thought were interesting? Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that I, that I brought up yesterday was um, that there's a lot of companies like, uh, like Booking.com and... and um, and a lot of others that have some scalability issues with uh, with open source software, okay. Um, but um, which they would like to see addressed, but 
they don't want to commit full-time staff to, to solving that, solving those issues. Uh, and they don't want to, and, and they don't, yeah, and they don't want to hire people themselves to work on them, but like, they're quite willing to donate money okay. to have those issues fixed. So, uh, one one thing I brought up, um, one thing I brought up yesterday was that um, the company that I work for and a lot of other companies uh, donate large amounts of money to open source projects that are important to them. Yeah. So, as an example, uh, Booking, I think, donates something in the order of uh, 100,000 euros a year to the Pearl Foundation, because nice. we use Pearl for a lot of things. And basically, the relationship that we would like to have with that open source project is that we would like work to be done on it. We don't want to micromanage what gets done. We, we would simply like to hand somebody a paycheck, uh, like sorry, hand the foundation yeah. a, uh, a sum of money and say, we'd like for you to use this on Pearl 5 development. Uh, and then they take care of all the details. They hire contractors and so on. And as, lo like as far as we're concerned, as long as stuff is getting done, like we're happy with that arrangement. Mm. Just in the same way that we use some commercial software like uh, Oracle, MySQL, uh, Atlassian products and so on. And uh, like we understand that if we use a piece of software, uh, we have an interest in it being maintained and developed. Yeah. Uh, and we're quite happy to pay licensing fees for these commercial projects. Uh, and similarly, we're quite happy to, to make donations to uh, open source projects. It reminds me of a discussion that was recently on the Git mailing list. Yeah. Uh, with, a, with a guy who was, had uh, done some implementing of, of a, a Git feature or, or fixing it up, I can't quite remember. And then he got to a point where he said that, you know, without any commercial investment, I, I, don't, I can't complete this because it's just too much work and I'm right. doing it on my free time. So, right. So he was kind of looking for uh, um, the same thing, I guess. Yeah. Some sort of, uh, sounds a bit like bounty source, you know, where you have these kind of market where you can go and say, I want this uh, yeah. to be developed for Git and I'll give, you know, $10,000 to have it uh, made. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, a thing that I wanted to bring up was uh, like, how, can, how could we start something like this for Git? And uh, the only, the only case that I'm really familiar with is the Pearl case, where it it works now, but it got it actually got started in quite a haphazard fashion. Okay. Um, which which I think is interesting if I uh, if I describe it. Yeah. Uh, so, I think Booking.com actually started it. So what we did is uh, we handed it like I may be I may be inaccurately representing this, but this is the way I remember it. I think we handed the Pearl Foundation one year uh, a check for thirty thousand dollars. And we said, we'd like for you to, to use this on Pearl 5 development. Uh, we, we didn't care how it got done, whether it was bounties, whether they hired a contractor or whatever. Uh, so they essentially didn't know what to do with it. So that money sat in some bank account, I yeah. think, for like a couple of years. Um, but then one day, somebody who was uh, a core contributor already uh, came along and said, OK, like, I have a plan for how to use this money. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to like come up with essentially like a list of tasks that I'm going to work on and you can pay me like contracting fees uh, by the hour and then I'll send a report to the mailing list, the development mailing list every week or whatever it was, um, indicating what I've done and what the money has been spent on. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's still consensus on the list by the court, by developers, that's useful stuff is getting done, the foundation will keep giving me money. Sounds good. So the foundation was very happy to do this. Uh, and, um, and this has since spun into something that's uh, going on all the time now. I, I believe that um, the Pearl Foundation is employing either two or three full-time-ish positions now on the basis of this. But Are there uh, other companies as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there's a few. There's, uh, I think, CPanel, uh, a, couple, like a few others that, I, that I'm, I'm surely forgetting. But uh, the important bit was like from the perspective of a company like Booking, uh, as long as you see something like that being done, like you're happy to give more money because now, like we know, like hey, they're they're making a lot of use of these thirty thousand we gave them. How about we give them some more on a continuing basis? Yeah. Uh, so that way you can bootstrap something like this, where companies that are interested in having the the project go forward, uh, but are not like the size of Google or uh, or you know. The size of Google, where they can just, where they simply hire in-house people to do this kind of thing, or GitHub, where your entire business is to do with Git. So obviously, you work on Git. Like we, we sell hotels, yeah. but we use Git. But we're interested in it working well for us. 
Uh, so we're happy to donate some money to it. So I think there's a large, I think there's a long tail of companies that are, um, that have that same sort of thinking, and um, and if we could set something like that up for Git, that would be super useful. So in practice, I'm, um, um, I was talking to Jeff King and um, and a and a couple other people about how we could like do that maybe through the Git Foundation or or something like that. And um, or, it's not the Git Foundation technically; it's it has a legal structure that we discussed yesterday. Yeah, uh, <laughs> which I mostly forget. But um, but uh, yeah, I think that's uh, something that's really useful to look into. Yeah. So any there aren't any concrete plans on how that's what that's going to look like yet? Uh, no, but uh, but I'm definitely um, I'm definitely willing to uh, to uh, continue that conversation. And just to be clear, I'm I'm just a senior dev at uh, at Booking. Like I know what we've done with some other projects. I'm not a I'm not somebody who's empowered to give money to Git. Like uh, <laughs> that was sort of a running joke yesterday. But um, but there's there's certainly like an informal consensus that uh, like I've talked to some senior people uh, that are actually empowered to make these sort of decisions. That if there was something like this for you know Git and other things that we find um, useful, you know th this would be no problem for us. Um, we probably wouldn't donate the same amount of money that we donate to Perl because that we literally run everything on Perl, but uh, we definitely you know, pay to do some, some of that stuff. Excellent. Well, uh, that sounds really interesting. Any, anything else you want to mention about yesterday or today before we cut it off? Oh, just that this uh, it's a fantastic conference. Happy to be here. <laughs> I, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, Evo. Yeah, thanks. And that's the end of our Git Merch Part 3 episode. There are two episodes left of the conference waiting to be published. I need some more time before I can get them out. In the meantime, you can go and read some Git Rev News, which is a Git newsletter put together by Christian Coder, Nicola Palucci, and myself, with a lot of help from the Git developers and the community. You can find that at git.github.io. Once again, you can find the show notes for this episode on links.gitminutes.com slash 37. And there you can also support the show via Flatter or Gratipay. A big thanks to everyone supporting the show, including our sponsor, DigitalOcean. Sign up using the promo code gitminutes10 for $10 of credit and you'll be supporting the show. You can post feedback or comments directly under the show notes or send me an email on feedback at gitminutes.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.